Ladies and gentlemen, this podcast is scheduled for one fall. Dude, I'm not reading the rest of this. You don't even pay me. Just click your button, start the show. Hi everybody, welcome to the Gimmick Table. We got another great episode in store for you. We have our first tag team in noise pollution. The team of Mad Max Morrison and Relentless Rock Richards. And this was a great episode. We had a lot of fun with these guys. But before we get to the interview, first to let you all know, this episode today is sponsored by Gamefly. All our listeners are welcome to try a free month with Gamefly. That's one game out. And all you got to do is go to GameflyOffer.com slash PGT and get yourself a free one-month trial. As always, I'm your host, Matt, and I am joined by my lovely co-host, Bats. How's it going today? Um, I am looking lovely today. I'm a little upset with you, though. We do currently have a poll going up on our Twitter. That's at gimmick underscore table about our rap battles from our last episode with Benjamin Banks. Now, I'm currently getting my ass handed to me by Bats and Benjamin's rendition of the theme song to Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I did not vote in this competition because I acted with integrity. I voted for myself. He did, which is bullshit. So go out there, listen to him, and keep that fact in mind and vote for the right person. Yeah, but don't vote based on your opinion of me or Matt because that wouldn't be fair to him. Just <laughs> oh. vote based on who had the better rap, which yeah. I guess is still unfair to you. So sorry. Yeah, well, I think the fact that probably, you know, Fresh Prince was a more popular show than the Waynes Brothers probably helped you out. But that's neither here nor there. Now, one more thing, Gouge Wrestling will be holding an event as part of the Hopscotch on September 8th, 2017. It's going to start at 1 p.m. It's going to be in front of the Ruby Deluxe on Fayetteville Street in Raleigh, North Carolina. So if you're from the area or you feel like traveling down to North Carolina, catching some good weather, catching some fun, good indie wrestling go out support gouge wrestling we've had the opportunity to have a couple guys who have wrestled on that promotion from our very first interview with seymour snot victor andrews check them out you won't be disappointed so again guys that's going to be on september 8th 1 p.m rally north carolina gouge wrestling part of the hopscotch in front of the ruby deluxe on fayetteville street all right so now we're going to get to our guests today. So ladies and gentlemen, please join us in welcoming to the gimmick table the team of Mad Max Morrison and Relentless Rock Richards. Noise pollution. Welcome to the show, guys. How you doing? <laughs> What's going on, fellas? What's up? Now that we've once again handled all our technical difficulties, so glad that you guys can be our first tag team ever on the show. Sweet, thanks for having us. Definitely, it's an honor. Yeah, thank you for reaching out to us and asking us to be on the show. And that goes really for anybody. I mean, if you want to be on the show, you know, we'll sit down with you. We'll talk. We enjoy having conversations with people. Starting with you, Max, what was what influenced you to become a wrestler? Oh man, let's see, let's see, let's see. Man, I feel like we told this story before, but um, as far as me, I've always been into wrestling ever since I was a kid. You know, comic books and wrestling. I watched it growing up and then uh used to do it in the front yard with my friends and then I grew up, got a college degree and then found an opportunity where I was able to do it. So I was like, Hell, it's now or never so I got into the business. And and who were some of those guys growing up that you watched that really made you want to become a professional wrestler? For me it was definitely like staying in the Road Warriors when I was a young kid. And then as I got older, I started watching, like, Jake the Snake. And then fast forward to the Attitude Era, I started watching Stone Cold. And then he pretty much became my foundation for a lot of the stuff I'm doing now. Yeah, I grew up there. I was fortunate enough to be in my late teens when the Attitude Era was at its peak. So I feel like we are some of the most fortunate wrestling fans ever. Yeah, uh, for sure. What about you, Rock? What influenced you to become a professional wrestler? I don't know, I guess you could say is pro wrestling is a really good mix of entertainer and athlete. You know, I've always been involved in sports when I was in school and always just kind of uh, idolized all the guys that I watched as a kid and I wanted to, to be like them. So, 
And who were some of those guys? Yeah, you know the little kid, and you know the top guys are going to stand out the most. You know, it's the guys like the Ric Flairs and the Hulk Hogan's and stuff. And that's when you're like a real small kid, you know, you look up to those like larger than life characters. And then once you get into pro wrestling and learn a little bit more about it, then you kind of, you start seeing uh, further into the characters. And then my interest started changing and I kind of like liking more of the, uh, the bad guys and things like that. Some guys that would stand out would be guys like, uh, oh man, like Jake the Snake, guys like Ted DiBiase, some of the stuff like the Macho Man. And I even was fortunate enough to see a lot of the older guys too, like the Briscoes and Wahoo McDaniels and stuff like that. But I think every single person I ever saw stepped into the ring, you know, something that influenced me. And when did you get to the point where it went from, you know, I'm just a fan to, okay, I'm going to do this? Started when I was like, you know, early teenager and me and my buddies are watching wrestling and then we're out like on this trampoline, like doing the moves to each other. And then it turns into, you know, when most normal people stop watching wrestling, period, like when they're in their later teens and high school. I was a kid that was still totally into it, still enthralled, still going, wanting to go to shows and stuff like that. And then I found uh, a training center when I was in my early 20s, and it was kind of like I couldn't resist. I mean, I went in and started training. I probably lasted a couple of weeks, and then I was back out boozing and chasing women. <laughs> but it wasn't actually until I was uh, 35 that I started to train seriously and completed my training. So you went the you went the DDP route of it, waited till you hit, you know, 30 plus years of age and mm -hmm. started living your dream, which that's awesome. I mean, a lot of people, as they get older, they're like, no, I can't do that now. You know, I'm too old, but you went out and did it. So kudos to you, man. That's fucking great. Thanks. I was like, I was just hitting that age in my life where I was running out of time to be able to do it and actually do it the way I wanted to. And I found out that um, a local guy was who had a school was selling it. And I went to my the owner of my gym and I like, really pitched this idea to him to have a wrestling school at the gym. And he was a, a real big pro wrestling fan himself, man. And he, uh, he, he went for it. I literally live less than a minute from, from the gym. So at that point, I had no excuse. Nice. That's awesome, man. And now that school, that's where you trained, Max, right? Oh, at the uh, Southside School of Wrestling. Um, it's not exactly the Southside School of Wrestling. It, it originally started off that way because you were talking to my buddy Banks last week, and I <clears throat> got my start at the same place he did, the uh, Southside School. Uh, Mark Anthony ran it for as long as he did until about a couple of years ago, and they ended up selling it off to the gym that Rock was just mentioning, and then it ended up turning into primetime wrestling alliance and that's that's where i ended up completing my training because uh back at south i started off with mark anthony teaching all the basics but then marty reed uh he would come in and he would do the advanced class teach us moves give us a little bit of psychology kind of you know give us an idea of what we're supposed to be getting into and then he transferred over to the new system over at pwa so we worked with him for a little bit and then we got really fortunate because he had to leave for personal reasons and then we ended up getting a uh former nwa champion well he's a current nwa champion now but the dude's been like a journeyman for years and years but we got damian wayne in there as a trainer he's been you know he spent a good bunch of time with us teaching us psychology and whatnot and taking us on the road and that's where we were able to get our training finished up at and going back to you know when you were underneath mark anthony marty reed tell us what that was like tell us what the takeaways you got from that and how that impacted your career well, I mean, that was where I got started in this whole crazy adventure journey path that I decided to trek down called professional wrestling. See, because I got started right as I turned 30 years old. Like, I literally just had, had a birthday, like, two weeks after I stepped into a wrestling ring. <laughs> and three months before that, I just got my college degree. So it's like, funny enough, I end up going to a, uh, I end up going to a yard sale for one of the Tidewater Comic Con. Well, the guy that runs that, his dad introduced me to Mark Anthony and said, hey, this guy's in school if you're interested. And I was like, yeah, I'm down. So I gave it a shot. And Mark pretty much taught me all the basics. And luckily enough, I was one of the older kids in the class as far as like coming in there and doing stuff. So me and him pretty much had like a, uh, we had a report right off the bat. Truthfully, there was a couple of times I was about ready to quit, but he talked me into sticking with it. You know, I broke my wrist and 
got hurt a whole bunch, but still never stopped. And then Marty ended up getting a whole bunch from Marty. I think my second match actually in wrestling was with Marty Free back at uh, the gym in Yorktown. So I ended up getting a whole bunch of knowledge off both of those guys. I mean, they both showed me, showed me the ropes and taught me a whole bunch to at least get started. Tell us how you guys ended up teaming together. It was probably about six months into my training, and um, I had done the beginner training for a couple months, and then when Wayne took over, I moved up into the advanced class. Yeah, I was going to say, mind you, to your credit, man, you moved up like hella quick in, in all of those classes. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say, and, and honestly, the reason being, I mean, the training class we had was Kevin Cross, Urban Legend, Mad Max, and myself. I was fortunate enough to go in there and be with guys that were way advanced I pretty much didn't really have a choice but to, like, get up to speed quick or get left behind. And so about probably six months into the training, uh, Wayne had the book down at um, Next Evolution Wrestling in Elizabeth City, and he set up a match for all us trainees. And it was, uh, uh, it's like there was, like, was it six men, three tag teams? Yep. <laughs> and and, Man, and me and fun. Max got stuck together. We kind of... Uh, we kind of had a similar look and similar uh, characters. And uh, after that, I felt like since they all had almost a, a year's more experience than I did, I asked Max if he would be interested in, you know, working as a tag team because, A, there really wasn't a whole lot of uh, legitimate tag teams in the business at the time. And B, because I felt like it would be a lot easier for someone as green as I was to be able to keep up, you know, to have that person I can just well, tag out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a pretty common theme with everybody we've been interviewing is those tag teams are a real good way to get introduced into like the whole ring in front of a crowd. Yeah, it was definitely for me as a you know, you can go into the training center and practice the, the moves and the psychology and stuff all you want, but when you get in front of a, a live crowd and your heart's beating a thousand times a second you can't hardly catch your breath. Uh, things are a little different then. Well, that's the thing, too, man. It's just getting in front of people. Sure, like like Rock was saying, you can prepare with knowing the moves and how to do stuff, but you ain't going to really know and learn anything until you really get, man. It's like trying to practice war. How do you practice <laughs> war tactics? Well, you have to go into one to learn what to do. Pretty much what we ended up having to do. So let's go ahead and uh, elaborate on that. Starting with you, Max, what was the experience like when you got into the ring from the first time? <laughs> okay, not even going to lie. First time I got into a ring, I, it was pretty surreal to me because I always had, like, I have always gone to the shows. I had always seen it on TV. Like, my biggest thing growing up was, like, man, I would love to be in a ring. So when I finally had the opportunity in the training center to go in there and step through the ropes and stand in the middle of the ring, I was like, man, this is cool. And then Mark Anthony told me, all right, go ahead and take a bump. So I was like, what? Do you want me to do what? <laughs> <laughs> so I took my first jump and about, yeah. about knocked the air out of me completely. I was like a balloon just deflated right there on the spot. And I was like... <laughs> Step but in the at the same time, once, once I caught my wind back, I kind of looked up at the lights and Mark was like, are you okay? I looked at him and was like, yo, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and it just got better and better from then on. But the first time I actually got like out in front of a crowd in a match was at a tattoo festival in front of like however many people were there. And I was in the ring against Irvin Legend. And it was cool because I had some people I knew in the crowd. And it was typically my kind of scene because I knew a lot of people that were very and a lot of people that were there anyway. So I've been in entertainment for like 12 years already. So I knew how to be in front of a crowd, but I didn't know how to wrestle in front of a crowd. So that was like a completely like mind-blowing experience. So once it was done, it was kind of a relief. Yeah, it's got to be a big you know hump to get over you know oh for sure man because it's like at the same time you're trying to you know you've never wrestled before you're figuring yourself out you're wearing spandex when you've never done that before a day in your life especially in public so it's like god forbid <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then then you just kind of have to do the thing you know and entertain the crowd it's like entertaining the crowd's one thing but being the wrestler is a whole different animal yeah i but i feel like a a a tattoo festival is probably the one place where the spandex would be accepted without any, you know, 
judgment. I felt I felt like I got over okay because I was wearing like one of my old band t-shirts because I used to play this band called Unhinged back in the day. So I, I was wearing that and it came out to Pantera. So I mean, I pretty much like, you know, connected with the crowd almost instantly. You know, I knew my audience. Yeah, that's got to make it a lot easier. Now, Rock, from what I understand, your first match actually was when you were in noise pollution. That is both correct and incorrect. Okay. It is correct because my first match was, in fact, a tag team match with me and the mad one there. But what was incorrect about that statement is that we had no idea that what we were going to call ourselves or that we would actually pursue a tag team career until after uh, that match went over pretty successful. That was the uh, determining factor pretty much was just how that match went. Now, did you have a name going into that match, though? Like I, no. no, 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 that was something that we kind of just came up with at training one day and uh, one of those deals where once once we said it, it couldn't be unsaid and it just it had a, a ring to it, kind of described us, it kind of described both our personalities and so it seems kind of catchy, it's catchy, um, catching on here seems like. Oh, it could definitely be the name of like a, a punk rock band or a grunge band for sure. Yeah, that, I, I felt like that's kind of what we were what we were going for. We're, uh, we don't necessarily claim to be the musicians, but we're just into that scene, if you will and we're loud and obnoxious that's it man we like to drink we like to party we like to fight and we like to goof off and it all gets wrapped into this big tornado of just exactly what you see out of us and it's fun now rock what was going through your head during your first match my heart my lungs really I mean, I guess the best way I can describe it is, you know, it's like it's like getting laid for the first time, you know. I'm out there, you know, I, I'm so excited. I can't believe it's finally happening. You know, in the back of my mind, I know I'm probably not doing that good of a job, but I don't really give a shit, you know, because it's just, it's like, it's the most um, excited and the most afraid I think I've been at the exact same time, you know, since the first time I got laid. Probably even worse because the first time I got laid, I really didn't give a shit about my performance. <laughs> so, I mean, every, every, like every, I mean, your, your lungs are on fire because you can't breathe. Your heart's beating a million beats a second. You know, it's like everything, the, the noise from the crowd of all of the 20 or 30 people that we wrestled in front of seemed like it was at a million decibels. I mean, it's like all my, all my senses and everything were being engaged all at once. I mean, I'm not, I am not going to lie. I had a pretty crazy lifestyle when I was younger but being out in front of the crowd and doing my things uh you know it's like it's the best drug I've I've had thus far yeah adrenaline's a hell of a drug man I'm sorry he, he could not have said that any more creepy I was trying to say it like Rick James <laughs> <laughs> Cocaine's a hell of a drug. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going for. Somebody got it. Yeah, I, I get what you were trying that's, to do. You're just no Rick James, sir. I'm Rick James, That's bitch. right. I put my feet on his couch. Fuck your couch. <laughs> what did five fingers say to the face? Wow. Oh, I had the microphone on that. Yeah, watch the microphone. <laughs> so, kind of elaborate on who is noise pollution? Shoot. We're, dude, we're we're Bebop and Rocksteady from the Ninja Turtles, dude. Yeah. I mean, yeah, with a little bit of Three Stooges in there and a little bit of Beavis and Butthead. Yeah, we're, we're the, you know, the wasted youth of America after they went and growed up. It's, it's funny you should say Beavis and Butthead because when I was thinking of what I should do for the cover for this, I was actually already thinking of doing that. Oh, uh, that's perfect. Cause, um, I'm actually looking at Beavis and Butthead right now. I keep a cardboard cut out of them rocking out in my living room. Like a life size? Yes, sir. That's got to scare you in the middle of the night if you're kind of fucked up or something or not really awake. Not really, man. Like, if anything, the cool part about keeping them around is it's a motivational tool because, check it out, no matter what I'm doing, whatever's going on, however I'm feeling, if I'm feeling like shit, I'm feeling amazing, whatever. I look over and I see Beavis and Butthead rocking out. I know it's okay because they got my back. I actually have a <laughs> horror story with a cardboard cutout. I was like 10 years old and my, my room was in the attic and my mom decided to get me a cardboard cutout of Jack Nicholson as the Joker. <laughs> that's, that's a great idea. And I walk up the stairs and there's a little nook, half a wall, and Jack Nicholson is just standing there dressed as the Joker. And I'm like 10 years, I freaked out. Oh, 
Yes. That was horrible. <laughs> Here's Johnny. <sighs> oh man, yeah, that that's definitely that will that will torment a youth quick. Noise pollution. We're we're the we're the guys that are playing our boombox in the in the library, man. We're the we're the <laughs> we're the guys that like purposely fart in the elevator, you know. <laughs> and then press all the buttons. We're, yeah, we're the, we're out. We're we're partying and we're enjoying ourselves and we don't really give a shit if you mind or not, you know? Yeah, do what yeah, I like, want. I mean, regardless, we're gonna do our own thing and if you're down with it, cool. If you're not, so be it, you're lost. And you guys you guys are fans of headbutts. Why? Well, <laughs> Uh, that's that's kind of my deal. Yeah. <laughs> who are, did? It, Although he enjoys using your head as a weapon. Yeah. Who came up with the idea to smash two heads off yours at the same time? Well, he, Max has got the chrome dome, so I that's figured it. like instead of like using my head for a head bump, I should just use his. Yeah, dude. I'm a I'm a legit metalhead, so it's like, well, let's go ahead and use this thing. Shit. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why not? It's another weapon that not everybody else has. Yeah, and that's the thing. You know, you got to kind of take advantages where you can find them. So luckily, I found out I had a I had a pretty hard noggin, and I started smashing that thing around on people, and saw what it did, and I was like, <laughs> well. I guess this is going to keep happening then. Steel chair? Then, Psh, I got steel head. Yeah, so it's like, you know, we keep going on and going on and start doing stuff. And then Rock's like, well, here, I got a couple ways we can use this. We can use that sucker. So then he starts using me as a weapon. And it's like, all right, cool. So that's it. We got there's our offense. That's yeah, uh, pretty effective. <laughs> like I said, man, we uh we we we've watched a lot of Three Stooges in our uh, years of existence on this earth, man. So they definitely play inspiration into a lot of this stuff. Uh, you, you've been practicing getting hit in the head for quite a while. Is what you're saying? Uh, I played the fifth. <laughs> So kind of go, besides the headbutts, what are some of your guys' favorite tag moves to do together? Well, dude, we don't, um, we don't do anything really fancy, you know, so, um, I mean, we'll, we basically do like a move, a singles move, and we just do it in stereo, you know, uh, something as simple like a double back elbow or a double suplex or something like that. I mean, I think my favorite one is where we just, we, the one of us tags the other end and we just take the guy and pull him out of the corner, give him a little hope and just at the same time just slam him right back in the corner you know it's like why do something uh we don't need anything fancy yeah you guys definitely have like a brawler style just beat him down no frills about it just we're gonna beat you down pretty much, pretty I know much. one of my favorite moves that we'd done was uh we were wrestling against the hellcats one time and that and they'd like start getting over on us start beating us up in corners and then they figure they'd try to whip us into each other right so they whip us into each other and we we're just kind of looking and it's like all right hell we're gonna go ahead and mosh right here so we go ahead and mosh each other and it's like an anthrax pit and we circle <laughs> around and end up whipping each other back in and end up smashing these fools in the corner it's like the best thing ever <laughs> yeah. yeah no i definitely got a little uh, green street hooligans vibe watching watching your match there <laughs> Um, you and Rock like to have fun, man. That's that's like the key thing when we go out there and we start beating people up and wrestling and fighting, especially with our tag team stuff, man. We go out there and just try to have as much fun as possible. Yeah, we definitely, we got to watch a couple of your matches over the last few days and you guys are really fluid with one another. I know you guys haven't been a tag team for very long. I, a little over two years, a little under two years. And it's right around two years. Right around two years. Yeah, so I mean... It's right about right at two. Really, I mean, such a That's a solid relationship. (laughs) Right, for, you know, yeah, for you. But, (laughs) I mean, and I think in the means of a tag team, I think, you know, to be as fluid as you guys are for that short of a time, really enjoy the matches. And you guys are... Got some heelish behavior, which for me, heels are my favorite. So, I like what I saw. Yeah, we had... um, I mean, we had the, the luck and the ability to... We train together, you know what I mean? It's not like two guys that, uh, just, you know, meet up and live, you know, in a couple different states and arrive at the shows at separate times and then say, okay, we're going we're gonna to be a tag team. You know, me and Mac trained together that entire time. And then once we had our first match and decided that that's something that we wanted to do, um, you know, Damien trained us as a tag team you know from that point on we were basically like uh his legit tag team and we that's how we trained and you know pretty much when we worked on stuff in training it was uh we worked on being noise solution so we were kind of fortunate to to get that opportunity that was our that was our focus you know wayne pushed us that way and we were 
like Rock was saying, we were definitely fortunate. I mean, we picked each other's brains. We've been able to figure out. We know what each other eats for breakfast. I know what he does for work. He knows what I do when I'm sitting at home. And oftentimes, it usually meets in the middle, and the universe is parallel right down the middle between the universe. So, like, everything falls in place between me and him, and it just it really works out because we've been able to get to know each other as people and get to know each other as wrestlers, and we're able to harness that in and bring it together. Yeah, we're not, we weren't like two guys that said, let's be tag teams and then forced ourselves to like get along. We, you know, we got similar size, similar looks. I mean, similar taste in music, similar taste in movies. I mean, we're both horror buffs. You know, we both love, you know, loud metal. You know, we both kind of both like uh, into the same kind of thing as far as our careers outside of wrestling and you know, if if I think if if me and uh, if me and Max had met each other outside of the ring, we would you know we'd be uh, buds. Totally. You just have to be going and bar fighting everybody instead of fighting them in the ring. Yeah, I mean it would, it would just <laughs> probably be that way. Go to some concerts yeah. and mosh. Yeah. Right. So it's more it's more than just being tag team partners. It's there's a bond between you. But yeah, that, yeah. And I think that um, the best thing for each of us is that like and I'm I'm making those quotation things with my fingers. <laughs> are our gimmick for us isn't really a gimmick. It's it's actually who we are, and so I think that it it, it comes it comes off well to people that are watching because it, we're, we don't have to act like anything but ourselves. So in the ring, yes, that's us, and and if you see us at the bar, that's we're the same way. And that's it. It's just we're loud, we're obnoxious, we like having fun, and we make sure everybody knows it, and we don't make apologies for any of it. That's for us what works. That's that's pretty metal i apologize guys i'm gonna get him a writer once we start getting some you say revenue. that every episode i've yet to see a writer <laughs> i haven't gotten any i have these revenue. notes from you write your own jokes before the show <laughs> i just wrote that one right now you don't even have a pen i wrote it in my head i pretty much say it every time we get asked that kind of question you know everyone in wrestling tells you that um, when it comes to figuring out your character, you take the certain aspects of yourself and turn the, the volume way up on them. And I was told Max and them guys, man, this is going to be great because now I finally get to take the governor off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you just have an excuse to be mean to everybody. Yeah. Well, I just, pro wrestling is the place where I can actually be myself and not get arrested for it. <laughs> like the whole and thing. I think kind of, that's the mad ones the same way. Is, yeah, because I seriously, this is like the only place where I can get away with shit that I can't get away like with in everyday life. Since I got the relentless one and like side, side by side, we like to get into a lot of shit. So I ain't getting into it alone. And the cool thing about us is like either way we tear the I'm gonna do the air quote thing too. The gimmick. If people like us, hey, come party. Come party with us. It's all cool. But if people don't like us, then it's like, well, we don't want you to come party anyway. We're gonna do it by ourselves. Bottom line you is you're having that party either way. Either way it's going down. <laughs> <laughs> so what's what's it like on the road together? <laughs> I keep hearing about this. I got to know, you know, you keep talking about partying. I feel like... You yeah, know. you guys are real good friends. You must have some pretty good stories. <laughs> yeah, we've oh, done. yeah, definitely. We, we, we definitely done some stuff. <laughs> you know, for our partying, um, you know, we're, uh, we are we take what we do seriously. You know, our, our partying takes place after the match. I mean, the match is the party. And what we do after that is kind of like the after party. But we, we have really good times on the road. And since, uh, like, I'm in Yorktown and max is in virginia beach you know we don't uh get to hang out you know every single night so the our weekend time is like you know a good time to catch up you know we talk about what we're gonna do laugh and joke and have a good time you know on the way there and we get there we beat people up you know and then uh get back on the road you know and then it's party time now you guys how do you guys travel do you take like a, a bus or like a coach they have a private jet well he doesn't understand you know he doesn't get you know you guys got well, private jets sure they all have private we were we were yeah, well. taking we were taking a jet everywhere and we found out that i didn't know how to drive one <laughs> you, you you know <laughs> randomly flew into some airports they were like yeah you can't do that anymore 
Yeah, we figured out I didn't know how to drive one. That kind of fucked up that opportunity. I tried to drive a couple, a helicopter. couple weeks ago. I uh, was partying with uh, with Jimmy Flame on his, and I left my uh, matter converter on his on his jet. And uh, <laughs> so right now, my teleportation device is out of commission. Oh, uh, come on, man! You're supposed to get that back like yesterday. Yeah, I know, but man, he's been busy. He went to Philly. Yes. Yeah, that's no excuse, though, man. Jimmy, dude, Jimmy just ate Royal Farms, man. He could have went and got got from him then. Just told him to bring it with him. I, I hope he didn't leave it there. Ah, uh, shit, maybe he ate it. He probably used the, you know, device to get to Philly. I just, it was just a matter converter, so that, you know, it's just, it's just a part that I need for the teleportation device to work. It's almost he was, like... He was, uh, uh, he was, it's almost like a battery. Yeah, you know, it's just the only one in existence. No, no, there's plenty out there. It's just the one we need. Just Jimmy's guy because rock and bone <laughs> Yeah, Mike. My jet. My guy was out of town, so he was going to take it to the guy that works on his flux capacitor for him. <laughs> and then we, you know, we got we got drunk and started partying in the jet, and then we never made it. And I came back home and left uh, the matter converter. See. I can't really remember where I left. I don't know, but you need to find that thing, man, because I'm getting tired of driving everywhere. It gets old after a while, man. You know, that's the thing about wrestling that really, like, I think destroys wrestlers' bodies. It's not the wrestling. It's not all the, you know, the, the banging and the beating. I think it's when you sit there and turn around and cram yourself into one tiny position and stay there for, you know, five or six hours for the trip somewhere else. I think that's really what uh, does damage on you. The travel is the worst part of the gig. I mean, it's the best part of the gig because, truth be told, man, we're having a adventures and exploring and going off and doing all kinds of odd things but it's just the physical aspect coming out of the car just the creaks the cracks the crunch just ugh. yeah yeah all right guys and we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back with you all right guys like we said earlier today's show is brought to you by gamefly.com sign up for a premium free 30 day that's one game out trial specifically for our listeners of the gimmick table and how you get that great deal is you go over to www.gameflyoffer.com slash tgt again that's going to be www.gameflyoffer.com slash tgt and remember guys the wwe's got a new video game coming out before you go out and burn 60 dollars on a video game whether you that you don't know if you're going to like or not Take a chance with Gamefly. What do you got to lose? Low membership prices and you can cancel at any time. You can rent games and keep them for as long as you want. And they got games from every single system. All right, and we are back. One of my favorite matches was when you guys fought for the SWE Tag Team Championships against the Hounds of Hades. Ah, no. No? Yeah, what you meant, what you know what? What the uh what you miss on YouTube is those cheating turds. They came out and they hit us with the belt. Then they did but the I game guess they're like goddamn twin magic or whatever that crap is the Bellas did, man. But yeah. they see they're they're not that bright because they obviously didn't know that Mad Max has an impenetrable dome piece and I come to the ring in uh leather armor, so it hit me in the back when I wasn't looking and they hit Max in the head and I guess they they, uh, they just assumed that they did some sort of damage because they made the mistake of turning their back on us. And that's when we uh, we turned the tides a little bit on them. Yeah, then they tried to say that you were you had something in your hands when you just hit him with his head. Yeah, they actually had the ref check my head to make sure there was nothing in there. <laughs> well, the ref didn't and, I, and, I, and I, I assured Justin. the referee that my partner has nothing in his head. <laughs> nothing. Yeah, it's, it's not like Pete and Pete's mom. <laughs> <laughs> you don't just have a metal plate. We can bounce know. a garage said, door opener off. I said, "Ref, trust me. If if it, if anyone knows, it's me, and there's <laughs> nothing in that head." <laughs> Wait a minute. You can see through one ear and out the other. <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> so what was it like to to get a shot for the titles at the risk of uh, I, I really don't want this to, to come off as arrogant or anything like that but we actually been fortunate uh in our endeavors that was probably the the umpteenth time that we had fought for uh 
tag team titles. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think a lot of that, you know, was just uh, by chance or luck. Mm-hmm. But that was uh, definitely not our first time going for going for gold. Yeah, that was probably one of the closer times we've had with it, though. Like I said, man, those uh, those hounds are a bunch of cheating bastards. Oh, did you see on Facebook, man? Apparently they're North Solution fans deep down. Did you see that? No, really. Oh, yeah, I did see where they, they, they scored a couple of our hats. Yeah, they even scored your glasses, man. Oh, nice. Yeah, they were like the ones that I wear. Yeah, they were all about it, and they were like, "Don't oh, pollution rules." Why didn't you tell us? The, why didn't you tell us before? Yeah. We could have been, been friends, but now we gotta keep fighting because you guys are dicks. And, and I don't know how the ref couldn't tell because I don't know how the ref couldn't tell. He should have taken the sunglasses off. That's what I told. Yeah, him. you know. They're both fat, but still, come on. <laughs> we are, you know, one hundred percent behind you guys. My man. If they email you tomorrow, you're going to be like, oh, well, we'll find a way to squeeze you in. <laughs> then tell them how you hate those noise pollution guys. <laughs> right? <laughs> we get them on, and then we just, you know, have you guys wait on the line. We could never figure out how Ambush. to do that. And we could just, you know, have you shoot on them. Uh, hitting the old double cross. But if I didn't have them on, I would not be supporting indie wrestling. I must remain unbiased. <laughs> That's true. So now, how, yeah, how did how did you guys since uh let, let let noise pollution ask some questions? How did you guys get into covering uh, pro wrestling? I've been a fan since I was God five years old. Since my dad used to watch it, my uncles used to watch it. Macho Man growing up, Ultimate Warrior. Got older. I mean, I still love Macho Man to this day. Got into ECW when I was in my teenage years. There was a long time where I didn't watch wrestling really during like the ruthless aggression era so like there's like a whole decade and then a couple years back i started watching and really started getting more into the indie stuff you know new japan ring of honor and oh man you missed so much i'm sorry to cut you off but you missed so much i know i'm going back don't 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 feel bad i missed all that and i still don't watch uh new japan or a lot of ring of honor stuff like that dude uh, yeah, it's it's still it's still 1989 as as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to catch up, man. It's just a slow progress. It's a slow progress. Yeah, but I mean that's and then we we had another podcast that was more silly than wrestling. But then I wanted to do something more than just talking about the WWE Raw and SmackDown review. So I was like, let's interview guys. Let's get them on the show. Let's help promote them. Let's do something positive instead of being you know a lot of internet fans out there that just like to bitch and complain that somebody's not doing what they want them to do. Yeah, and I'm noticing it's kind of getting like, uh, like uh, we'll use uh, metal for an example, man. It, lately, it, it seems like it's in to be a little more uh, counterculture, a little more, and I hate to use the term because it gets thrown around a lot, but a little more underground now. Like it, It's hip now to not like WWE and to be uh, more into the indie scene as far as wrestling goes. So, I mean, for for us, that's kind of cool because, you know, if it wasn't for that, like, trend, I don't think anyone, you know, you, you guys wouldn't know who we were and you'd still be covering the Raw and SmackDown, you know? I mean, for me, what it came down to, I appreciate what you guys do. It's something that I love. And what you guys risk going out there every night, like, I just wanted to personally give something back and help promote people. And, you know, we're not here to make money yet. We have little sponsorships and stuff, but that's really just so we can do the best show possible and still eat because that's nice. But really, it just comes down to helping people. I think at the end of the day, that's all we want to do. That's cool because, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's that's really the name of the game in pro wrestling, too, is for anybody to get ahead. We all got to help each other, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. We've been fortunate to have a lot of bigger podcasts, you know, really listen to us and help us out, you know, support us, get our name out there, and it's been really successful. But what you said about indie wrestling earlier, Rock, I, I agree. I think what a lot of it is is I think people are starting to see the limitations in the WWE and I, I agree that, you know, they have limitations and I get why they have them. And I think people just, I think they're tired of seeing the same old thing. And a lot of people out there in the indie scenes are really trying to not just do new things with moves, but with their characters. I'm doing the quotations, their gimmicks and stuff like that. So I think what you guys are doing, what other guys are doing out there from New Japan, Ring of Honor, it's refreshing. Yeah, I think the, the game has changed too. I mean, with the being like on the indie scene, uh, I noticed when I watched, first watched like some Lucha Underground, they did a really good job of bringing you up to speed on a character really, really quick because in WWE, 
it's mainstream, so you can kind of introduce yourself to the crowd very slowly. You have all the time in the world for them to, you know, to figure out who you are as a character and to invest in you as a character, whereas, like, on the indie scene, man, no one's ever heard of you. You pretty much have to get over who you are and what you're all about in the first, you know, 15 seconds of coming out of the, the curtain. So definitely, I think you see a lot of larger diversity of characters there. Uh, a lot more guys are, uh, like we said earlier, to quote, turning the volume up on a lot of things and, and cranking it way up there because they have to get that message across almost instantly, you know. And slapping them legs way harder. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new landscape out there, man, on the indie scene, man. It's, it's a lot different than, you know, what I'm used to seeing because I'm an old dude. You got you to gotta push those boundaries. I mean, you have to. Yeah, you know. Just stay relevant in day and age. Like Rock was saying with the game changing and whatnot, because a lot of what we've been used to is the old Memphis style of slow storytelling and whatnot. And now everything's like northern, fast-paced, this and that, this and that. And that's cool, and that's where the business is going. As long as the story's still being told, that's the important part at the end of the day, truthfully. Personally, that's why I'm a fan of Lucha Underground. And the one thing I do love about it is the fact that the way they do tell their stories is definitely way different than the way anybody else is doing it because it's a TV show about wrestling. And that's necessarily a wrestling show but a tv show about wrestling so they're treating it as a tv show well i don't know, you know if I mean? you've ever seen like a spanish soap opera but even if you can't understand the words like even if you don't even have subtitles that shit is enthralling oh dude i can't tell you how many times i've been drunk on telemundo man i get i get sucked <laughs> into there i've cried a few times <laughs> you don't even gotta know what's <laughs> going on those this, this chicks are believable Right, you just the looks. The drama is real. It's funny you say that now because when I think about watching like Lucha Underground, I definitely get that vibe from it. And like, if you've ever watched um, like some anime or like some of those like Japanese films, I, ha- I have no clue what that guy is saying when he's like, <laughs> but the way that he's saying it, like, I definitely get what he, what he means. You can feel the and that that approach that approach is kind of like it's like the saying the words and actually that's kind of how their wrestling is like the New Japan stuff is like they build into and then it's like you know like uh they really hit you with it with the moves and what they're doing and I can kind of I kind of see like a correlation there you know. Well, the other, well, the other thing too, man, is like you gotta realize it's like with like Lucha Underground, that's like that perfect merge of Hollywood and wrestling because old uh, Robert, Robert Rodriguez is like the producer of that thing, and he's done all them movies and stuff we were watching, like Dust Till Dawn and Black oh, yeah, Hair, right. yeah, Death Rod, all that stuff. Yeah, and I mean like with um, and where I'm going with that is like um, I'm, have any of you guys ever watched like anime? that strong style that they use over there where the guy's like, he's getting hit with everything but the kitchen sink. And at the end, you know, he pops back up. I mean, that's exactly what happens in anime. You know, the, the, the hero gets beat, I mean, literally to death. And right as you think he's, he's dead, then he uh, discovers that he has some new power he didn't know he had before. And then he, now he's coming back. Right. The hero is always evolving by getting beat down. Right. So he's the thing that like would kill a normal man is what gives him his power. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's definitely like entertainment value right there is watching those guys beat each other up really hard and then popping right back out of it. Yeah, just so they can fight more. Man, I'm one of those guys. I don't care, man. It's wrestling. If it's wrestling, it's wrestling, and as long as the business is still going. So be it, you know. I mean, I think we're at a really good. I think we're at another good point in just wrestling as a whole. I think you know you had the Attitude Era, which was really the last peak in wrestling, and I think you know the the indie scene is making a big push to show people that there's more than what you're going to see on network television out there, and there's a lot of guys working their asses off day and night putting on great stories inside the ring, and you're going to get to see a 20 minute match that's going to tell you more than what you're going to see in you know. A month's worth of programming you know on the wwe that's the other thing that i have a problem with current wrestling product is the fact that the, the business has become so progressive that in the old days you would have guys that would feud for like a year and a half until you got your payoff they would build it up yeah. so much to the point where it's like i have to 
pay this money to come see these guys fight because holy shit, this is getting intense. And they would do this for like a year and a half before you get that final payoff to see what's going on. And now stories aren't even lasting nearly as long. You'd be lucky to be able to drink a cup of coffee by the time it's over. You get like a month or two or maybe two or three months out of the story and it's done and we're off to the next mm-hmm. one, man. It's like, it's hard to really build up any kind of with the current product that's going on in the industry now. And they seem to even do that with, like, popular storylines. They seem to cut them short. Way short. Well, what's the what's the story if the guys wrestled each other 50 times before the pay-per-view? Well, that's... You know, and Paul that's Hogan and Andre problem, the yeah. Giant, they, 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 Andre the Giant, you know, stalked Hogan for a year, but they never actually got to really wrestle each other until WrestleMania. You know, that was the, the, the big draw. That was the payout, you know what I mean? It's like, in today's product, in today's society, Brock Lesnar, everybody's got an opinion on Brock Le- Lesnar being like a part-time guy, but he's about as close to old school as we have with the storytelling because with him being champion and him not being around all the time, you're actually able to stretch out stories with him because of his schedule and whatnot. So you're able to actually drag it out and build to something to build a suspenseful payoff with Brock Lesnar. And then every time he comes out, it is a spectacle because he hasn't yeah. been fighting in a while. Yeah, because you didn't see it last week and the week before that and the week before that. <laughs> yeah, because you're going to see it for like two, three weeks, and then it's gone for a couple months, and you see it for two, three weeks, and then there's the pay-per-view, and then you work from there, and then you see him for another two or three weeks. You can get a whole year span out of that guy because you don't work as often. It's like, yeah, you could totally build stuff up because he's not there that often. People like to shit on these part-time guys. I'm using Brock as the example. That's how you slow build stuff. That's how you build suspense. That's where the that's where the fun happens. All right. What is your guys' dream match? If you could face any guys in any promotion, WWE, New Japan, Ring of Honor, whatever, what's the one tag team you'd like to get in there with? I'd have to let Max uh, answer this one because any of the guys I would say are either in like their 70s or dead. So. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you want to bash off of Max's skull? That's the question. Who do I want to bash off, or who do we want to bash off my skull? Yep. I would say, I would say probably Bubba Sky and me and him. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> truthfully, man, if I had to pick one one team in the world that I could definitely have some fun with, I would want to go up against War Machine, Hanson and Rowe, because those guys are big, they're bad, and their matches are brutal and entertaining. I would like to get in the mix of that. Me and Rock, I think we could do some fun with those guys. That'd be it for me. I can't, I can't argue with that because they are two of the funnest guys that I've seen in a long time. I think nowadays tag teams are back on the upswing, and they're really one of the guys that are going to help elevate it back to what it once was. I agree because those guys are fluid as fudge. Like those guys. They move. I've, I've never heard that before. Those guys are it. You just said fluid as fudge. <laughs> I'm losing it over here. Hey, I know we can cuss, man, but I'm still keeping it kind of what it is, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it was just, that was great. <laughs> that, I just, that was one of the most clever things I've ever heard. I mean, I got to be honest with you, man. If I come out of the curtain and I'm in a 110 degree armory and there's 15 people out there i don't think it would be any different for me if i came out of the entrance way at a wwe event there's a hundred thousand people there man i'm i'm in my element doing what i love and so to say like who's the one tag team you want to fight man i don't i don't give a shit dude you know just put me in the ring with somebody and you know put one person in, in the in the audience and you know i'm in heaven so true true Anyone, anywhere, anytime. Yeah, man. You know what I mean? It's like whether it's, like I said, a sweaty, stinky hole in the wall or, you know, the the mega ultra dome. You know, it, it don't matter to me, man. All right, man, Max, this one's for you. Vouch for Benjamin Banks' clothesline. Fuck that shit. <laughs> <laughs> See, your head might be impenetrable, but from what we've heard, if you take a clothesline across the chest, uh, you're getting knocked flat for a little bit. This was probably about three or four months into my training. This is when I first met old uh, D-Money, <laughs> Mr. Benjamin Banks. 
<laughs> I'm doing the training deal. He comes into the thing. It's like, all right, Max, come take the clothesline. This is when I'm learning the clothesline. I took one, and uh, I felt like I got hit by a Mack truck. <laughs> like, holy shit, this is what I have to look forward to? Guess I got to toughen up. But if he didn't hit me as hard as he did that day, it wouldn't have uh, inspired me to be as tough as I am now. Is that the hardest clothesline you've had in your career so far? No. <laughs> oh, because he said, I it's think one spe- of them. specifically, one he of said them, that it was the hardest. Not the hardest. Him and Bats are tag team partners now, the Fresh Princes. I feel like we got a match coming up. <laughs> oh, that's right. You guys were, uh, yeah, you guys are in his corner now, ain't you? Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. I'm just a man. We're all friends here. <laughs> yeah. He's his tag team well, partner. Well, I'm not. Well, here's. Here's the thing. We're on neutral ground, guys. Because as far as me and Banks go, when we're in Virginia, we don't exactly see eye to eye. But in this one little company in North Carolina, we're part of a stable together called uh, Mayhem Inc. We're pals. So it's right there on the teeter. You know what I'm saying? It's a little love-hate relationship there. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what events do you guys have coming up? When's the next time we can see you guys performing in the Squared Circle? Um, We've got events coming up next weekend. We, on the August 18th, we will be in Orange, Virginia, making our debut at Ultimate Championship Wrestling for their first show. We're actually going to be taking on Outlaw Inc. for the first ever tag team championships out there. Uh, Then the next night, the 19th, we're going to be in Havelock, North Carolina with Shockwave. I don't know who we're wrestling yet, but we're going to be out there. We were supposed to be wrestling the Hounds, but apparently both of them have a bad case of kennel cough, so that's off. So we're going to have to find a new opponent <laughs> for that. Well, they just know they're going to lose. Well, they're going to have to, considering they cheated last time. We're, uh, we got our eyes I open now. Sometimes, you know, we, we do venture off uh, on our on our own. Uh, What's the following Saturday after that? I think the 20, is it 26th is one of those Saturdays for this month. I'll be down at uh, Danger Zone Sports Entertainment in uh, Wilson, North Carolina for a little singles action. Is that the one against uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Flame? You know, I don't really know who uh, Viper's going to get me to beat up down there. There, there was there was rumors that, uh, that Jimmy Flame might come down there. I hope he does, because I've got a bone to pick with him, man. He said Popeye's chicken is better than Royal Farms, and I disagree. Well, I'm going to say Kennedy's fried chicken is better than both of them. So you're going to have to get up to Binghamton and get yourself some Binghamton chaos. Well, the, real question, the real question is, what sort of bone do you have to pick with him? Is it a thigh bone? <laughs> uh, I think it's, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be on like neck bone. What we're going to do now is we're going to unhinge the gimmick table. Funny that you had a band called Unhinged because this is going to be about band, sort of, kind of. It is specifically yeah, kind about of. A, a band. Sort of. So I'm going to give you a stable. This stable, in certain ones, I'll let you know what people, because I know some stables ran amok when they just started letting everybody in. I'm going to give you a stable. You let me know what instrument each member of the stable would be. Or not be, but play. All right, so the first one we'll start with is the NWO, and we'll just go Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, Hulk Hogan, a little three-piece. Oh, uh, just a three-piece? Well, who else you want to put in there? I mean, that's the original. Hold well, uh, Eric Bischoff. I like to see Easy in there on drums. I can see Hulk on the guitar. I like to see Big Daddy Cool behind the microphone, and I like to see Scott Hall on the bass. See, I feel like Scott Hall would be the same. Smooth- because he's a smooth operator. He can totally do it. I feel like Hogan would always be trying to get on the microphone, too. Yeah, I think I'd have to say that um, Hogan definitely was the, would be like the, the guitar slash lead uh, in the group and trying to give it like the dynamic of what role they actually played in the wrestling aspect of it. Definitely, uh, I could almost see like uh, Big Sexy being the drummer and Scott Hall being on the bass. And, you know, the Ho- Hogan was the front man. Scott, uh, like, was the, to me... Kind of like the, the 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 bass player is the one that's like really keeping the whole the whole thing together, but he's kind of kind of behind the scenes, you know. Like the bass doesn't really stand out that much, and I think that's like to me, Scott Hall was definitely the best wrestler and entertainer of all three of them. But you know, Nash was the one who was seven foot tall, and Hulk Hogan was Hulk Hogan, you know. All right, what about the Four Horsemen? Uh, which iteration of the Four Horsemen? The original. I'll let Rock take that one. 
Dude, that to me, man, it's like <laughs> they almost remind me like Van Halen or something, man. Yeah. Ric Flair was a loud mouth like lead man that doesn't he doesn't even play an instrument. <laughs> right. He's just <laughs> a front man. He just goes out there and gets himself over. <laughs> he gets yeah, fucked up much, and yells you know, at the crowd. Like, <laughs> but I mean just and and in and in the same way if you ever took him out of the group and had like a you know, a Van Hagar <laughs> it, just, it never would be the same, dude. He's right, man. He's, 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 the, he's the irreplaceable. Yeah, but how would that uh, work? I like Van Hagar more than I like Van uh, Roth. <laughs> oh, man. I don't think that, like, uh, man, I, you know, that's tough because guys like uh, Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard, man, were, they were really good at what they did. Yep. I'm saying in a, in a group, I don't know, would you have to put Ole on the drums? Ole could. Never mind, I'm not going to say anything. Holy. No, you know what? Oli, Oli would be like the uh, he'd be like a backup singer or something. Man. <laughs> he'd play a triangle or something. A tambourine. It'd be tough. I'd have. To, I don't think it would matter. Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard would be those two guys in the band that could play every fucking instrument up there. That's where I, that's where I'd put them. They could either one of them could be the the guitarist, the bassist. If the drummer you know was too hungover to play, either one of them could play that instrument as well. Pretty much. I mean, they were that good. So let's go to the Attitude Era. What about Degeneration X? And we'll just do, we'll do all five of them. X-Pac, Shawn Michaels, Triple H, The Road Dog, Badass Billy Gunn. And I'm wondering why the fuck I said X-Pac first. Why not? Yeah. But you would think out of every member of that group, the first person that would have came to mind would have been Shawn Michaels. Yeah, but when you think well, DX, you think like suck. The, the, the trio iteration, or we're doing like the, the five piece? Let's do a five piece. Do the Jackson five here. <laughs> yeah, let's tell us who DX. Let's, let's put DX as the Jackson five. So who who's MJ? Who's MJ? Yeah, I would probably put Road yeah. Dog MJ. I don't know any of the other members of the. Well, we got MJ Tito, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Jerome, Jerome. But I don't know enough about. Yeah, I don't know enough about <laughs> Jackson Five either to do this. <laughs> this is what it's, ABC. It's tough because 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 Mike started with them and then he later went off and had so much success on his own. Where someone like Shawn Michaels had all that success well before he ever got into the group. So you're saying Triple H would be Michael Jack? Um, I mean he no. is he. It'd be tough. It's a tough call, you know. I mean, you had the the fifty. Uh, what was it? The top fifty wrestlers, greatest wrestlers of all time. DVD, you know, put Shawn Michaels at number one. So I can make the correlation there with him and Michael Jackson, but I think the rest of the uh, the Jackson group didn't have enough success to be compared to like Triple H. Because if you talk about Shawn Michaels being one of the best, man, Triple H isn't that far behind him. Yeah, I don't. I don't think. I don't think the Jackson Five. Works no, that just doesn't for work DX. for that. Yeah, I don't think. I think you can pick one to be Michael Jackson, but any of them, like you said, had enough of a career where you could really. So if they well, were here, I got. Well, here I, I, I got. I got. I got it for you. I got it for you. If um, the original DX, the trio, Triple H, Cannon, and uh, John Michaels, if they were Motorhead, who's a three piece? Who would be doing what? I, well, I'm gonna put Triple H as Lemmy, just because. When he had the goatee. I was going to say, is that mainly because of his facial hair? Yeah, mainly because of the facial hair. From what he, I just, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's pretty much what it comes down to. Uh, I would put China on drums. Like them being one of those groups where that has like, they're a band, but they also got like a DJ and a bad rapper or something like that, you know, <laughs> like where Xbox would be like the, the guy on the turntables over there. And... What, like Limp Biscuit? So there's, there's Cypress Hill. <laughs> They're Cypress. Yeah, I, <laughs> Cypress Hill would work. That, 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 that that's coming actually. straight out of the same time frame, too. <laughs> that's probably like the height of Cypress Hill. Uh, Yeah, no, late 90s. Late 90s, early 2000s. When did How High come out? It was like 2001. Yeah, it was, it was about that time. Rock superstar, rap superstar. 2000, you, called, you know you're How High, sir. 2001. <laughs> Yeah, because I remember Taz came out to uh, Thug Superstar, which was actually a rendition of Rock Superstar from the Forcible Entry soundtrack. And then we'll we'll finish up the unhinging of the gimmick table with the Shield. Dude, they're um, dude, they're Destiny's child as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah, no, but no, no. I'm no. kind of having like thinking that thinking that as well. I mean, you have the you know Roman Reigns, who's uh, yeah. 
big like, dog in the yard. You're going to call Roman Beyonce? But people love Beyonce. That's the yeah. difference. <laughs> and then Dean would be like Kelly because he's like the so so. No, actually, I think Seth would be Kelly Rowland because he's like <laughs> higher up than Dean is as far as I'm concerned. Yo, who would be who if you compared the Shield to Nirvana? Obviously, we want Roman Reigns to be Kurt Cobain. Oh, that's fucked. <laughs> <laughs> We're not editing that out. Um, I would say basically Seth Rollins is Dave Grohl because he has all the talent. Okay. And then Dean Ambrose is just the guy that I forgot. That the was the other guy who is uh, kind of... Chris, Chris Novoselic. Yeah. yeah. The other guy right behind him, and then there was like the third guy who just... I could see it. Oh, nah, but... Huh. Honestly, dude, all, all jokes aside, man, all, all them guys are good. They're better than, than I, I am. So, All right, well, that's going to do it for the unhinged part. This was a really fun time. You guys have a really cool you, – you gel well together and just click off one another. It's really cool. It was, you got a nice vibe. Yeah. We definitely appreciate you guys taking time out of your day, even with all the technical difficulties and staying through the long haul with us here. Definitely appreciate you guys having us. It's uh, been a fun time, for sure. Yeah, man, we'll have to have you back on down the road. Sure, that'd be great. Definitely appreciate it. Yeah, anything we can do to help, that's what we're all about. As long as you guys have that that sort of attitude, you're going to find that people are really going to be willing to work with you. Well, I tell you what, if, you, uh, if you're looking for people to put on your podcast show, I'm going to throw out two names. And the reason I'm going to throw out these two names is because they've been running their mouth and they're getting ready to be made famous by noise pollution. Oh. Jimmy Flame, Matt Sells, Cheap Thrills. I got news for you, Daddy. Noise pollution is coming for you. Jimmy Flame, Matt Sells, your day is coming because we are about to stomp mud holes all up in your backside, and we're going to eat that Royal Farms chicken, Daddy, as soon as we're going to be headbutting and slam dancing and beating your silly, petty asses. All over the place, Daddy. Yeah. Ah, uh, noise pollution. Thank you <laughs> again for joining us. Thank you for being yeah, our first thank you guys. tag team. Thank you for dealing with our technical difficulties, which in the end weren't <laughs> that difficult. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, once we figured it out, it's all good. All right, guys. Well, that was our episode. Thank you again for listening. Thank you for supporting the show. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback. If you like the show, get on iTunes, get on Stitcher, give us a review. Let us know what you think. Get a hold of us on Twitter at gimmick underscore table. You can also get to us on Facebook at Facebook slash gimmick table podcast. Talk to us if you're a fan of the show. We'll definitely enjoy any feedback that you have. Tell us that we suck. We just want to get better. All right, guys, and before we head out for the evening, check out some of our friends. They've been huge supporters of the show. Uh, Tapped Out Wrestling Network. They're on iTunes. They're on Stitcher, Facebook, wherever you want to get a hold of them. Also, part of our little network, Wretched Wrestling, Wrestling Nerds Alliance. Raw is Bore. S marks the spot. Great podcast. If you're following a lot of the WWE, these are the guys you want to listen to. They're funny, they know what they're talking about, and they're our friends. So listen to them. If you like us, you'll like them. All right, guys, this has been another episode of The Gimmick Table. Have a good night. See ya. Hello.